going to be cheesy or bloated. Um, so we we did that, and then we had the problem of there already being a chat book called Shadow Twin. Naming the novel that would have been uh, problematic. So we changed the name to Hunter's Run, and and that was how that came out. That's that's amazing. I'm I'm not sure there's been many stories of novels that have that kind of gestation and that kind of co-authorship. But that's oh, no. that's a great story. It was story. weird. It yeah. was a weird it was a weird project. But uh, but Gardner and George are both uh, lovely. Gardner was another one of my uh, Clarion West teachers, so I had worked with him there too. So I knew both of these guys going in pretty well. Um, and certainly enough that I, I trusted them and they had seen enough of my work that uh, they trusted me at least enough to do that. So that was awesome. Okay. So um, this is a, obviously a, a Song of Ice and Fire themed podcast, but I did want to ask that you've been credited with with work adapting several works other than A Game of Thrones um, of George R. R. Martin. In, in comics, so I just wanted to ask, what was it? What was um, your first experience writing writing comics like? And was it for a George R. R. Martin book? Yeah, the the well, the first the first experience I had writing comics were for projects that never saw the light of day. I mean, that's kind oh. of always the way it is. I'm um, sorry. Yeah, no, that's that's normal. I mean, I have a bunch of trunk novels that I wrote too. That that uh, you know, you do that when you're learning, and I I did a bunch while I was learning. Um, and the first one I did for George, I think was Fever Dream. Um, we did a, a, an adaptation of that as individual, uh, comics and then a, a graphic novel that concatenated them. And then after that, uh, there was a novella called Skin Trade that I did for him. Um, and that was all kind of, I think those were, I don't know this, but I, I kind of get the feeling those were the, uh, the warm-ups to see if I could actually do it before the the question of adapting Game of Thrones came in. I also did um, a six-issue uh, run that got put together as a graphic novel called The Hard Call that was in uh, the, the wildcard universe that George mm-hmm. runs. So he had seen both my original work and my adaptation work before we started talking about Game of Thrones. And so I have to ask, um, just um, first, um, both being a, a novelist and also just someone who has obviously created a lot of his own major wor- worlds, what's it like to come in as the adapter? And, oh, it's, uh, it's a fascinating job. I mean, it's, it's really, really interesting because it's, it's different um, in kind than pretty much any other writing assignment I've ever had. It, it, mm-hmm. it's, the, it's the writing assignment where um, the point is that my voice should not be present. You know, nobody comes to George R. R. Martin comic book adaptations of wanting to read Daniel Abraham. That's, that would be weird. Um, so it's all about finding a way to keep George's voice intact and support the artist um, and really, as much as possible, give the stage to them. Um, so I, I feel almost like um, it's a it's a support role more than uh, a creative role. It's a it's a way to uh, interpret and shift things in ways that do the least possible damage in translation, mm-hmm. so that you still hear George when you read the comic books that he didn't write, but that are, that are his stories that should still absolutely be his story. Yes. It, it, well, I can attest that having read your adaptation of a game of Thrones, it definitely feels like George R. R. Martin. So that's so you definitely that's succeeded. The, uh, yeah. Good. I'm glad um, it worked. Good, 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 good. <laughs> um, so getting a, a little bit into the weeds of uh, of adapting a Game of Thrones. Um, I mean, it, obviously, it's a, it's a pretty intimidating. At least it sounds like to me an intimidating prospect. It's an eight hundred plus word novel that was already on the bestsellers before then the TV show, 
Mm-hmm. How did it come about? Like, uh, how are you approached for for um, adapting a Game of Thrones? Well, like I said, it, it started, I think, with a um, a few trial runs with other projects, mm-hmm. so that George could see how I approached things and and um, whether I was able to keep my hands off the story or if I couldn't keep myself from coming in and fiddling and improving, you know, improving note the scare yeah. quotes, um, the story. Um, and once that had happened, once we had that in place, um, I know that there were, you know, there were a lot of people who were being considered for that job. It, it was, it was mm-hmm. kind of a, uh, a high level assignment. Um, and I think, Having had the experience of working with me, um, of having seen what I did in that medium, and also uh, the fact that I live nearby, and if push comes to shove, he could, you know, come down to my track me down at my house and, and <laughs> head and shoulders. Um, I think all of those worked in my favor, so that when the time came, um, I, I wound up being the one that got the nod. Mm-hmm. So, um, I want to ask a little bit of what was your working relationship with with uh, Tommy Patterson? Was he your choice for artist, or was he presented to you as um, as the artist for the book? You know, there was a uh, a number of people who were suggested, and and I was part of the conversation about who. Uh, they chose as the artist, but I certainly wasn't. You know, they, they they didn't they didn't come to me and ask me to pick. Um, okay. Really, I think with comic books, the artist is is in many ways the primary creator of the work. Um, the writer is important and in and in fact critical. But um, with an adaptation, especially the the skill and vision of the artist is what is going to come to the audience before the words do, uh, before mm-hmm. the story does. Yes. Uh, so I, I think that with comic books, it is absolutely collaboration, but it's not an even collaboration. I'd say, I think probably 60, 40, um, with Tommy taking the lead. Um, and so I, I had input, um, I had, you know, I got to be part of the conversations about that. The final conversation, the final decision, wasn't mine, but I had a good, strong lobbying position, and I think Tommy was a fine choice. I think that was a good one. I mean, part of it was that we we managed to get him um, early in his career. I I imagine that the you know as he gets more experienced, uh, he will get and more known. He will get more expensive too. So that's Naturally. always a consideration. Always, always. Um, well, I mean, as a as an aspiring creator and I've written some comics myself and collaborated with artists. Yes. Artists are extremely important and artists take much of the harder work from the writers. So I will completely spend all my love on the artists and their work. Um, I mean, one of the early things to shout love to Tommy Patterson's work and what you did in, in adapting and this is no slight, although this is going to be a theme, I think, in a little bit in the interview. Um, but you you and and everyone else involved in this graphic novelization of A Game of Thrones are credited as coming, coming to it before the HBO series. Is that true? No. No, the HBO series was, uh, I think, in its first season when we were making this. Okay. Uh, but the licensing was of the book, not the show. So, I mean, it, it because of IP law and, and the way that the contracts were structured, we weren't drawing uh, pictures of, of, like, Peter Dinklage. We were drawing pictures of Tyrion as he was described in the books. Mm-hmm. Um, there wasn't ever any option for us to uh, take the scripts from the show or the images from the show or the likenesses of the actors and use those in the, the comic book. So it was a very, it was a very intentionally and necessarily separate interpretation of the book. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And um, well, I wanted to, I want to say like uh, I, I peruse the the chat rooms on Reddit of for a song of ice and fire and listen to people complain vociferously about the HBO adaptation. I do just wonder to myself, well, it's like, well, if you want the the purest experience as close as you can get to getting the books without being the books, why don't you go to the comics? The comics are, are where it's at for closer adaptation. I, I mean, I speak of just like the simple that it's only in the comics that you'll get the, the Stark children having the right color hair. Well, and and you you don't have anywhere near the same kind of problems casting a comic book as you do trying to find actors that work together well for the show. Um, I, I mean, any kind of translation has its own set of uh, obstacles and uh, and problems to overcome and and constraints. And I think that uh, yeah, there's some some real joy to having um, you know no budget constraints on your your comic book besides the ink and the artist's uh time that that's Absolutely. that's awesome yeah that, that lets that you is. do things that couldn't have otherwise um and yeah i i i think that the comic book w- was also long enough that um you know the 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 process of taking a novel and finding a way to fit it into like five, 10, 15 hours of uh, produced television. That's, that's a, that's a tall order. That's hard mm-hmm. stuff to do. Um, and I will say it's easier to- though. Like uh, as Martin said many years, it's, it's better than when the Hollywood people were saying it, they could compress it into three hours or even two hours. Ugh, that would have been awful. Yeah, no, that that wouldn't have worked. I mean, ultimately, I think, I think really the natural length of a feature film is about a novella. I think a novella is a good yeah. size for a feature film. Um, more than that, I think you start doing damage when you do the translation. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I think that's why Stephen King's novellas adapt better than his novels. Well, I, I think. I think as we start seeing more and more long form television though, uh, I mean, uh, there, there's some novelistic stuff you can do in television that feature films, uh, just, they don't have the, the number, don't have the hours to do it. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So. No, no disagreements from me. Yeah. Um, I, I, I am, um, getting into some of the things that you can though do, in a yeah. comic that you can't do in a, in a TV show. Um, one of the things I love that the that your adaptation was able to capture is honestly, this is going to sound maybe silly to some people, but the flashbacks of that you're able to capture the moment when, and this wasn't done in the HBO show, and it and it's one of my favorite moments in the books is when Sander Clegane relates to Sansa Stark just her, how he got scarred and how he became just like his horrid appearance mm-hmm. and just like his horrible backstory and his threat to Sansa for repeating it. And that's just such a powerful sequence and you did such a magnificent job with that. Well, and, and you know, again, because of the way that this translation works, what I got to do was stay as close as possible to the way that George had originally written it. Um, so when I'm working on, on any given chapter, I get to use and and consider the structure, even the structure of the chapter that mm-hmm. George wrote, uh, and I get to to steal them, <laughs> and uh, you know, find ways to to uh, take all as much of the information that's in them and that can be told visually and give that to Tommy. Um, and then everything that can't be told visually, that's what I get to carry. And so between the two of us, um, we get to, we get to get pretty close to what the original chapter looked like changed, but, but structurally, um, very much related. So that, that's, uh, that is something that the format just allows us. That's, that's really, really nice, really awesome. Mm Mm-hmm. 
I am curious, just um, speaking about that on, on, on the terms of structural adaptation, was there any particular chapter or just moment or anything in general that you thought was, this is going to be very hard to adapt and how am I going to approach this? Or were there big hurdles that you ever felt you had to do in translating well, something I've, I've, for the visual medium I've of written, comics? I've written about this. I wrote an essay about this for a collection, but the, the, the most uh, complicated thing to translate was Daenerys's wedding night with Khal Drogo. Mm -hmm. um, that is a very, very, uh, it's a fraught moment. It's a complicated moment. Absolutely. Um, and the way that it's approached in the novels, um, it's, you know, clearly you know it's it's a sex scene it's yeah. this is this is uh, a sexual moment and there is um this byplay between these two people and this this negotiation of power between these two people and this um it winds up connection between these two people where, where there didn't need to be a connection where this this could have just been um a moment of of um violation yeah um and in the books it's it's really i mean and 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 for a modern audience tremendously um difficult uh and and it, it, it's a challenging moment because of course uh daenerys in that scene is um underage she's yeah. she's very young um yeah. now yeah and and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go into um the historical precedent on that and how it reads to a modern audience and that's all <laughs> i carried in that um but for an artist that's problematic because if you stay to if you stay uh with the text you have created a piece of ancillary art, a secondary art that is um, illegal. <laughs> so uh, then, then you're you're however however it was intended in the novel. It, when you start drawing pictures of it, there's a different body of law that applies to that, and you start yep. getting into questions of child pornography, and that's not a good place to play. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, one, so this was a place where we had to figure out whether we elided over the scene or aged Danny up to um, better conform with the legal standards of modern times or, um, you know, did it all as text over black. Or I mean, there's a lot of different ways to approach that, and um, none of them are exactly what's in the text um and that's that's a that's a set of problems that uh, the television show i think had to wrestle with too yep um, oh definitely though, yeah though they had the advantage that uh amelia clark was not 13 yes yes so and yeah so that 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 kind of uh that that was the most discussed and problematic kind of uh issue to overcome mm -hmm. within the, the within my stretch of the 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 translation yeah well i mean uh luckily you didn't that was just one it's an important scene of course but it's not as prevalent as ellen moore and lost girls so well in yeah. perspective. okay but you know if yeah if Lost Girls is the standard that we're gonna. Yeah, uh, of course, no, 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 no. That's that's a that's that's kind of taking it to the edge. I'm just yeah, saying that, that is <laughs> Lost Girls. We'll let you Google it. That that is the yeah. absolute edge. Yes. Um, no, but but no, I don't want to trivialize that. That's a very important thing to consider. Well, and, and it's it's a it's a it's um, one of the things where there's this real asymmetry between the medias um yeah. when when you there are things that are illicit and permissible and 
less squicky um, in prose mm -hmm. than when you put an image to them. Yeah. Yes, that that's very true, and I can yeah, I agree. I agree. It's a uh, it's a question you have to ask. Um, I mean, I, I I defend what Martin chose in in making his characters be the age that they were because that's sadly a reflection of what the Middle Ages were like. Yeah, I'm into so, on that. I'm that that so I I, I I'm. I'm not as as committed to the historical realism argument as some other folks are. Okay. Uh, Fair enough. I, you know, it's just you know, if if we're going to be really talking about what the Middle Ages were like, yes, uh, there should be a Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> True <laughs> enough. With, True without enough. that, eh, you know, iffy. Um, yeah. But but I'm not you know I'm not second guessing any of the choices that George made. Um, or, or the decisions he had for, for his aesthetic view. I'm just saying that how they played out in my part of the game. Um, eh, tricky. Tricky, yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, I do wonder, because I don't want to belabor a point, but it is interesting that um, I've heard this from you, and I've interviewed the adapter of A Clash of Kings, Landry Q. Walker, as well about this. You both have spoken about fidelity to the text, and I'm just wondering, just compared to what um, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss, where they were a little bit looser with adapting certain moments, um, were there ever moments where you felt like that you wanted to change or maybe just add in your own flourishes to? No, I, I, I went in with the mandate of... Uh, don't keep my voice in this. This, okay. this, my my job from this from go was um, reform this text into a different shape. That was the the part where I mean the, there were things where you know not everything in the book would fit even into the fairly uh, extensive format that they let me do in a comic book. Um, but you know, so I, I needed to know, well, which details could I skip? Which could I, you know, it, here's a scene. Is this a scene I really need? Is this a detail I really have to have? No. Um, what of this can I leave out? If there are five people on the road, can I have three? Um, yes. And sometimes the answer was yes, and sometimes the answer was no. Um, and as a result, um, I had to go to George and say, so... Um, when, you know, here's this sentence and I'm, uh, do, does that, does that have to be there? And yes, that has to be there. That part is critical. Okay. Well, what about this one over here? That one's not critical. You can change that. One. Mm. Um, but part of the, part of the, the trick with adapting an unfinished series ah. is you don't know what the end is. You don't mm -hmm. know what you're building toward. And so um, anything that I did, especially that early in the process, um, I couldn't have uh, any confidence I wasn't doing violence to the story at the end. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, especially with something like something like George, where the detail and the richness and the, the setup is so profound. Um, yeah. You just don't want to come in and, and say, well, I think that uh, there should only be two Stark children, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, uh, I think it would be cleaner, easier to understand. Well, yeah, but it would be a different story. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I mean, that's that's an exaggeration, but it's, it gives you the idea of what I was up against. So I, I, I always knew that my job was never to change the story it was to present the story differently. Okay. Well, I mean, that's a wonderful answer. And, um, I mean, I do wonder that a little bit for for some of the moments in, in a Game of Thrones that are just set up for things that Martin really doesn't even go back to or pay off until sometimes the third book or even the fifth book. 
Mm-hmm. And so, no. were there so, yeah, I had that. moments where, where Martin just kind of said, oh, that's important. You, you should keep that in. Yes, absolutely there were. Really? No, yeah, absolutely. No, I would go to him and say, so this this right here, is that, is that, I mean, and he'd say, yeah, no, that's, I mean, um, I know some details about uh, A Dream of Spring. Because Ooh. of the conversations we had about uh, Game of Thrones. I mean, there were things he was setting up in early chapters in Game of Thrones that are references to uh, the end of the series. The end wow. of the series. Um, yeah. All right. So, I mean, I, there, there's... He, he had a very clear view of what of those were negotiable and what weren't. And he had something he was aiming for at the end. Okay. Well, uh, you've, you've teased a lot of uh, listeners here, and I'm not going to press you to tell, detail those, <laughs> those things. I mean, we got as much of a, an idea as we're going to get with the series finale of, a, of Game of Thrones. But as, as all of the book fans immediately point out, well, that's the, their interpretation and their adaptation. That's not what he's going to do necessarily with with his book so we'll find out we'll, well find out. that's it's it's uh it's it's his it's in his lap now so whatever whatever he's gonna do with the books he's uh got a free hand okay yeah absolutely actually this might be a good time to ask it's something that i'm just um curious to ask professional authors about i mean Famously, Neil Gaiman said it perfectly. George R. R. Martin is not our bitch. And uh, Stephen King has also chimed in. And when I interviewed Landry Q. Walker, he weighed in. But what do you make of just like the the fan kind of reaction and just begging slash being angry at, at Martin for not for um, for the supposed delay between a dream of uh, between uh, the, the last book and the upcoming book? Even though I say in his defense, he wrote an 800-page history book in between the books, so I don't know what you're talking about. He's writing. Well, you know, I, I, I think, I think there is a misapprehension that George doesn't work hard or that he doesn't care. Oh. Um, the guy that I know um, cares deeply about this project mm-hmm. and um, works you know, very, very hard on this project and um, has spent, I mean, uh, the majority of his adult life oh, working gosh. on this. Yeah. Um, I, I the, the idea that he is somehow taking it lightly does not match my experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and creative process is hard i mean everybody's is different there's no given rule for how uh an artist produces and how quickly they produce and how uh they ought to um i i I understand people being frustrated that the project isn't done i think george is probably frustrated that the project isn't done (laughs) um and you know there's only there's only so much of this that can be dictated. Uh, and then once you're outside of that, then you're outside of that. that then it's, yeah. then it's uh, an individual person's um, individual process and, and engagement with the project that they're on. Um, I, that's, that's not something, I mean, I, I understand why people uh, think that this should be simpler or that this should be more like um, someone going to work and, and, you know, I did 10 years of frontline tech support. I've had, I've had a day job. This is, <laughs> this is a different thing. This is, this, this behaves differently and less predictably. And uh, it, it's, it's not something that can be, turned out to a timetable not and yeah. not and have it come out the right way i mean it can be i mean there are i i have 
certainly had friends and cohorts who could put out a uh, a novel every six months, you know, rain or shine. Um, they're not George R. R. Martin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one of the things I, I, I did say. Um, my father and I, n- not to get too personal, but uh, we were talking a little bit about how Stanley Kubrick, after a certain point, he's just his he made less and less movies as the decades went on. And my father was like kind of sad about that. But then I said, like, well, but what if he made bad movies? And then my father 100 percent agreed. It was like, yeah, you don't want them to make garbage, though. If it takes yeah, as well, long as it takes to make a good mo- a good movie, take that or a good piece of work. Take what time you need versus people. I will wait whatever amount of time it takes. And I just love personally everything George R. R. Martin is writing. So I will take Fire and Blood Volume 2. I will take another Duncan Egg story. Whatever he wants to write in this world, I will read. <laughs> well, there's, there's a... Uh, so I don't remember where I heard this originally. There was advice on how to be a great writer. Mm-hmm. And it was throw away all the good stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. It's not great. Don't put it out. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, to my, to my, to my taste, um, the best science fiction writer, like ever, um, is Ted Chang. He doesn't put out a whole lot of work. Everything he puts out is uh, a Ted Chang story. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and yes, I am grateful for each and every one of them. Um, I don't ever expect to see a novel from him. If I did, that would be amazing. But I'm not going to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that he's any less than the best we've ever had because his process is rigorous and exacting and slower than the market would like. Hmm. If you want great work, you got to take how the great artists work. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just the way it is. It is. It is. So getting back a little bit to uh, adapting Game of Thrones, uh, was there a particular moment that you were particularly proud of for adapting uh, that you maybe like a favorite moment of sorts? That's a good question. Um, I remember the I, I I was pleased that we got to get um, drunk acrobatic Tyrion in. I mean that, that's one of those things that that people often kind of forget that he that was part of his character in the first book, mm-hmm. um, and the the scenes with. Uh, with him in the aftermath of Bran being pushed out the the tower, um, that was a uh, that, that that whole. All, I, I think the Tyrion line through it all um, came together really nicely, and and it's interesting too because it's such uh, it's so much Peter Dinklage's role now. I mean, yeah. it, you you can't really think of Tyrion without. That picturing him and he owned it i mean he he did Absolutely. an amazing job he is a, he is a tremendous actor and uh, mm-hmm. and that was a great role for him um but he's also not he's also he's also a stunningly handsome man <laughs> <laughs> and and Tyrion in the books is not yeah uh, so so we got to we got to do that in a way that i don't think uh, Dave and Dan could have. Yeah. Well, you adapted you just, him when, when he's still like relatively prettier. By a storm of swords, he's also noseless, so he's just ooh. Yeah. No, he's, he doesn't. He doesn't go better for him. Nope. Um. But but his uh his essential um. I'm almost kind of Dick Tracy villain um, ugliness in the book. It mm-hmm. informs who he is in a way that it's hard to do when you're as good looking as Peter Dinklage. Yeah. 
Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so I think you already a- answered my question, but I will ask just for for, for asking sake. Um, what, what, did you have a favorite character adapted when you were adapting the book? Was it was it Tyrion or well, Tyrion was great. I I I I also uh, really enjoyed spending time with Ned Stark. Mm, I, yeah. I think I think the um, the noble naivete of that character. I mean, he he's so clearly the hero of the story, and. Um, what George does with him is brilliant um, mm. as a way of saying this is not the story you thought it was. This is not the world you thought it was. Um, mm. And I, you know, I, I, one of the things that was really nice about this project um, was that it required an incredibly close reading of kind of one of the seminal fantasy books of the generation. You know, I, I, I went through every chapter very closely i considered the structure very closely and i got to see a lot of the uh the the gears because i could talk to george about it and i could see what he had done to to set things in motion in the story um and really game of thrones is the ned stark story it's it's the story that ends there everything else kind of gets launched um ned story is complete in that in that first novel um and that that made it kind of special for me that made it kind of interesting for me mm-hmm. in a way that um the others necessarily were introductory yeah well i mean the some people want to ask about the whole the question of john snow's parentage is the one lingering thing about about ned stark going forward but yeah, that is very true. It is Ned's story in uh, Game of Thrones, very much so. Uh, I am, I am curious. Just getting back a little bit to the idea, um, you're able to preserve what what what's in the novels, and I think this is just a thing about novels in general versus both TV and movies it, that comics can preserve is the inner monologue that you're able to preserve the characters' thoughts at times and what they see and what they don't see for what events that are happening like uh you do have that that and and it works way better in comics than it does as voiceover yeah do you, i'm curious just you as a as an author but wh- why do you think that is like why do you think that is well because it's um textual i mean the comic books are still text and the the experience of them is therefore mediated by the speed at which somebody reads them. You can read a comic book slowly. You can't watch a movie slowly. Hmm. The movie's going to go in its own pace, whether you keep track or not. Um, If you can't linger over a scene in a movie, it's going to change in, you know, two minutes and 30 seconds, whether you're ready for it to go or not. Um, and so all of the things that you get from text wind up being preserved in comic books in a way that they can't be in uh, a, a visual medium that is tied to timed performance. Um, with a voiceover, especially, um, there's... There's a, a delivery that you get if you have like a, a, a an actor saying it that's bounded in time it's bounded in their expression of it um and it kind of breaks the the flow of the third of the objective camera that you have necessarily in in like television or movies mm-hmm. with um with comic books and with text that opportunity for subjectivity and for timelessness, um, it 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 doesn't get broken that way. Interesting, yeah. So, one of the things I uh, I think we're starting to wind down a little bit is, um, but I wanted to compliment again and just ask you, 
uh, one of the things you're able to preserve is some of the dream sequences that Ned and uh, Daenerys have. Um, mm-hmm. I especially love you. You get to show the Tower of Joy scene, which they didn't get to until about season six, I think, of Game of Thrones. And they did it. It was a different context, and the, mm-hmm. just and just seeing uh, the the scene where Daenerys like sees a vision of her son as an adult. And uh, also seeing herself in Rhaegar's armor. That those are great scenes in the book. And what was it like translating that? Were, you, were there any special notes you gave to to Tommy in terms of both layouts and just like art style? I I didn't give a whole lot of notes on that to Tommy. I, though I think he did get to work with with George and with the publisher and get his own set of feedback and notes separate from me. I mean, one of the other things about this that's um, important to keep in mind is I was a member of a team. Um, It was not, it wasn't just me and Tommy. It was, there was a whole uh, editorial support and support from George um, that, that fed into making this the best version of it we could make. So, um, I mean, I'd have to go back and look at the scripts to say exactly what I told Tommy. But I, the 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 um, the blue rose was one of those issues that we had to to check, go back and check with George to see whether the it, it's a little bit um, ambiguous when um, you look at the text whether the the rose petals are blue or whether the sky is blue when you get to that one sentence in the book and so we had to go to george and say are the rose petals blue or is it the sky and he's no it's the rose petals okay and then then we know it's the rose petals (laughs) so that's that 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 one particular example is is uh, a good one for why it was so critical that we had george as a resource and that george could direct us as we interpreted his work that's great and that seems a rare a rare wonderful thing to have of have the creator there to help really be involved and assist you with the adaptation process um well and 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 we also tried not to get in his way (laughs) (laughs) true enough enough. it's uh it's hard having um that kind of mission creep when your project gets big um that that you know yeah while you're writing could you also vet these scripts or look at this <laughs> art or, yeah eh, gets it gets uh gets a little onerous after a while of course of course uh i think we've covered almost everything but i wanted to um first i'd like to just say congratulations on um on your your series um, being renewed at Amazon. That sounds really awesome. Thank you. It is uh, what we were hoping for. It's going to be a good year. It's gonna, I, I I know the uh, the structure we're looking at for that. It's going to be it's going to be a good story. Mm-hmm. Good. And and that's a great talking about teams and translation. The the team uh, at Alcon and Amazon that's doing the expanse is. It's a dream team. They're amazing people. Yeah, that's great. Um, I do. I do want to just. Uh, this isn't an expanse interview, but I did want to ask. Like, um, are, are you going to, to do anything like with Amazon that you couldn't do necessarily at Sci-Fi? Um, I, there are um, certainly different choices you get to make editorially when you know you're going in for streaming and. Uh, the standards and practices on streaming are very different from basic cable. So yeah, there, there was some freedom, especially actually the the big one was uh, some flexibility in the runtime. When you're doing something mm-hmm. on a broadcast network, there's you know not not because anybody's being mean or doesn't have a creative vision or whatever. It's it's a business and there is a yeah. runtime and you gotta you gotta stick to that. Um, that in streaming it winds up being much more flexible so if you need a couple more minutes to let a scene breathe you get a couple more minutes to let a scene breathe it's not a big deal that was very nice i mean this is an odd comparison to make but uh i remember the fourth season of arrested development they just 
were crazy with the run times of that season of just one one episode was 39 minutes, but the next was 20 minutes. It just, you know, just however time they needed for each episode. Mm-hmm. That was and great. That, that's a, it's an interesting obstacle to have go away. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, kind of, a, I'm curious, um, with with Game of Thrones, um, you, you sound like you've had a lot of freedom, but at the same time, you do have the limitation of the single-issue format. Did you feel a li- ever constricted by the 22 page limit? Well, I recognized that that was the format that I had to work in. Um, and I, I moved to fit that. I, 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 I find that the obstacles on a project are um, part of what make it interesting for me. So, mm-hmm. um, and that, that works out in my own world too i have i have things that i i actually wind up putting in artificial obstacles sometimes so that i have something the kind of the front of my brain can perseverate over while the back of my brain tells the story um and it it was kind of like that with the the comic book format um knowing that i had 22 pages was in some ways freeing because then i didn't have to figure out how many pages i had okay Interesting. Um, now, once it got to the, you you, you should ask Tommy, <laughs> because <laughs> um, you know when I'm doing 22 pages, if I'm doing a page of uh, a comic book, you know I if I do uh, page one, panel one, hero looks heroic, full page, uh, that's a page. That's that yeah. I've just done a whole page. Um, I and I've dropped that onto Tommy's lap and had him have to figure out how to make it uh, awesome. So writing the script may be less, maybe less where you would feel that pressure than when you're drawing it, mm-hmm. when you're drawing the pages. You'd have to ask Tommy. I don't actually know the answer to that, but but it's an interesting question. Okay. Well, um, I'll see if I can get him on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we don't know. Uh, this is just a fun, fun fan podcast. We'll see. <laughs> I'm very delighted and honored that you came on to this little amateur show. Yeah, I'm glad I could. Um, so before you head out, and uh, I, I want to ask you just a, a few rapid-fire fan questions, if you don't mind. Go. Okay. Robert or Rhaegar? Robert. Robert? Any follow-up? Robert. Why? You know, he had been a good man at one point, mm-hmm. and um, I think the his, his excesses and failures were uh, very human for me, very very understandable, and um, ones that I, I identify with. And and I don't think at any point Robert was malefic, mm. passionate, dumb. Um, lost, but not malefic. All right, that's a great answer. Um, last two, just a uh, fun. Like again, this is just a fun, not serious question. Sure. Who's the rightful heir to Westeros? Um. Okay. Here's here's a, here's my answer. Um, there is no rightful oh. ruler of Westeros. The great chain of being is a lie. Um, mm. The the idea that a righteous king will rule the land wisely because of their descent um, is um, one of the central lies of Western civilization. That's something we should probably get over. Absolutely. Well, theoretically, we now have representative democracy, so we have somewhat gotten over it. Yeah, somewhat. we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Mm. Who knows? Well, uh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's Game of Thrones. The adaptation said, like, chaos is a ladder. It's just the realm, all of it. It's all an illusion. And I loved uh, that in Clash of Kings where George R. R. Martin, like, put that out there. It was like, no, 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 no. Like, Power's an illusion. Like, why do we convince ourselves that, like, this 
person that calls himself king is like the one holding power. Like, and I think there is a a way to read uh, a song of ice and fire that is a deep critique of the idea of the righteous king and the the great chain of being. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, in the same light spirit, but also a little bit more, just your own two cents for maybe the rest of the series. Who, though, should sit on the Iron Throne? I don't know. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> I've got pluses and minuses for all of them. <laughs> perfect answer, perfect answer. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on, Daniel. Would you like to plug any of your projects? Um, if you got a spare night to kill the expanse is on uh amazon prime these days you should check it out okay thank you so much for coming on and uh we we i loved uh, your adaptations and good work good luck on all your other future endeavors thank you so much thank you good talking to you good talking to you